Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Metroid Prime Remastered. In the last part, we left Fendrana Drift, went to the Magmar Caverns and found ourselves in new portions of the Chozo Ruins. And now it's time for us to immediately leave that behind and head to an entirely new portion of a different area. Uh, in particular, we are now heading to another port of, uh, another part rather, of Talon Overworld. Interestingly, you might remember at the end of the last part when we got the ice beam, there was a white door in that room you could shoot that also leads to a Talon elevator, uh, Talon South in particular. But you can't really do anything over there for now. There's like a missile you can grab, but for most of your progress, you're going to want to come this way. And uh, we're actually coming up on one of my favorite areas of the game, uh, visually and conceptually, even though mechanically it's a little more annoying in some regards. I didn't mean to transform there. A very minor issue with remastered, it feels like, is that the game tends to buffer some of your inputs, particularly with transforming in and out of Morph Ball. So if, like, an animation interrupts you, you're probably still going to accidentally press it, or get transformed in the case you press the button anytime recently. But now we're here. This area, I love this room's layout to begin with, but what you might notice there's a giant hunk of metal over there, but now we, now we got the Ice Beam. We can just two-shot any given flying pirate because we can freeze them and break them with missiles. A lot of enemies work like that. Uh, and it's honestly one of the best ways to kill enemies moving forward. Spice Pirate, creature critically injured. Cranial trauma indica indicates likely to brain damage. That feels a little familiar, huh? We haven't seen something like that since the start of the game. There's a reason for that. If you look on the map, this is the Frigate Crash Zone. This is the remainder of the start of the game. The Frigate Orphean has crashed onto Talon 4. A little weird that it crashed right here because it's about 20 feet away from where our own ship is, but oh well. Now, we can open the front door there, but you're not going to be able to get too far in the frigate for now. We need another power-up to get any kind of good distance in there. So, for now, our only goal is to just get elsewhere in the world. Hmm. You hear that Geiger counter sound? Ooh, blue. This crate appears to be the same type of container found on the Space Parrot Research Frigate. The material seeping out from the rupture metal is highly toxic. Analysis indicates this may be the Phazon compound the space parts we're using in their biological experiments our first time seeing the stuff and uh yeah it hurts pretty fast uh it is the technically highest damaged variant of lava in the game only it'll basically always damage you and they actually for remastered increased the rate at which phase on damages you it exponentially increases even faster in remastered than it used to which is mostly there to force you to get a certain power-up to get a certain artifact down the line in the game, but that's entirely a different content. Uh, not another topic for now. And yet again, I forget to scan the gunship. So, now that we have the spider ball, as well as the ice beam, there are a couple places you can go, but the main one we need to get back to is Fendrana Drifts, particularly the far portions of it, either the room after Thardis, or the very end of the pirate base. And the fastest way to do that is take the Talon Overworld elevator back to Magmore and then take the path we took from Thardis in reverse. Uh, unfortunately, there are no new items we can grab on the way here from memory. It's just a marathon of walking backwards. I'm speeding this up, but this honestly didn't take that long. I want to say this took like three minutes, not even. I'm just doing this to help speed things up. You could climb the spider ball tracks behind this elevator as soon as we first got here, but we actively can't open that door behind it because you need the ice beam. And not for nothing, I think there isn't a, a speedrun trick you can use to completely ignore Thardis entirely, come to that elevator from the opposite side and get the ice beam early so that you can just ignore that fight period, but uh, I think you eventually will still need the spider ball anyway, so eh. Ooh, top three songs in the game right here. We are now closing on Fendrana Edge. Uh, this region's got some good music. That door, by the way, leads to the Space Pirate Base's back door. So this area, you might notice very quickly, while it's still got a lot of the usual ice stuff in it, there's a lot more water in this area of the Fendrana Drifts, and there's a reason for that. And apparently it includes launching Samus, uh... We're looking for an item to help us uh, get through the water now, frankly. There's a couple of interesting enemies in here, like this glider. 
Docile airborne creatures with unusual magnetic properties. Gliders live a relatively peaceful existence. They have a magnetic signature attuned to common grapple beam tech. The sport of glider riding involves using a grapple beam to attach to a glider and staying on it as long as possible. But then, also, there's this. This is a Hunter Metroid, Adolescent Metroid. Scythe, energy Scythe and tentacles increase its threat level. As Metroids develop, they become more efficient predators. Energy draining tentacles allow them to attack from a distance. Quick to anger, a hunter Metroid will charge troublesome prey and attempt to ram them into submission. Cold based attacks are still quite effective against these creatures. In fact, same with normal Metroids. Even though all weapons can damage Metroids in this game, the ice beam and missile is still a really good combo. Now, notably, that hunter Metroid isn't there in every version of Prime. Uh, it was there in the original release, but I think the later two revisions of the GameCube release, as well as Trilogy, completely remove it. I'm assuming it was originally meant to be elsewhere in the game, and they just accidentally put one here. But it became iconic, so I guess they brought it back for remastered. Kinda weird, but oh well. And you need to shoot down the stalactites in that room, so if you haven't scanned those yet, make sure you scan it around here, because the last stalactites in the game are in this region. And oh boy, uh, more of these guys. Remember this room for later. It might be important. So, I get why it works from a game perspective. Why, when we freeze the flying pirates, do they just stay airborne while frozen? I think it'd be funnier if they just dropped down and cracked into a billion pieces like that one character in Terminator... 2? Or was that Terminator 3? It's been a while. So Samus Underwater, as we covered before, can't really jump that well. She's pretty slow, and I also forgot to mention back then, your vision is incredibly murky at a distance. It's hard to see basically anything. Uh, but we need to get through the water faster somehow, so that's why we've come to this region. And this is probably one of the farthest backtracks the game makes you do just for a normal power-up. Uh, and I remember frequently as a kid, I would get stuck around here just trying to figure out where to go because I was having a hard time remembering where any ice beam doors were. Also, you may have noticed in an earlier room we could actually see a missile tank beneath the ice, but you can't drop a stalactite to break that ice because you need to come from a different angle to be able to do that. And we're not going to have the ability to do that until we have the grapple beam ourselves, unfortunately. And uh, that's a pretty good distance from here, if memory serves. Or maybe we can do it at the end of the area, actually. I don't remember. <laughs> We're getting to the point now where it's been long enough since I edited the footage. I can't remember how some things go. Also, you may have noticed by now, the, the video length of this LP is kind of inconsistent. It mostly comes down to how close or far I was from a save point or an elevator to end the footage at, like, a good time span at. Uh, that's why some parts in this are, like, 15 minutes long, others are 25. I try not to go for a half hour, though. <laughs> Something about a hard half hour feels like a bit too much for a game like this, for a single spurt in my eyes. If you're having trouble figuring out where you can go in the water, the thermal visor is good enough for that, but also sometimes, as you might notice, you just get stuck on geometry for literally no reason. Thankfully, our time navigating the water in trouble is almost at an end, and you can even, if you use the scan visor, see it in the distance. We're coming up on the new item right over there. And what is it but good old reliable? As soon as I get up this ledge, there we go. Gravity suit acquired. No longer are we affected by a liquid environment with physics. We now can jump normally and walk normally in water. On top of that, they also clear up your vision. Not that that part really matters, it only really comes into play during these sections. But now means we can access a lot of items underwater we couldn't before. In fact, I actually showed one of them off earlier this very video. At the friggin' crash site, there was a missile that I think if you aim a jump properly, you can get on the first visit to that room. But if you miss the, that jump, you're gonna have to come back for it. 
Same with that missile tank behind us. We're not able to get that for a hot minute because we need the final beam in order to melt that stalactite right near it. I guess melt the ice. It's not a stalactite. It's an icicle. There are a couple of items, though, we're going to be going out of our way to get on our way back to the frigate crash site, though, now that we have the gravity suit, because this opens up a lot of opportunities for us. Although, I'm not going to lie, uh, not the biggest fan of the gravity suit design in uh, Prime 1. And it's a very minor difference, but the purples in the Prime gravity suit feel a little bluer than the usual ones. And the interior of the suit feels closer to the various suit colors than the interior of the gravity suit in Super and Zero Mission and all those. Mind you, I, I, not for nothing, I think my favorite gravity suit color scheme is easily the Fusion one, which is actually slightly relevant. Like I already mentioned in this LP, uh, Prime 1 and Fusion were released on the same day at launch. Uh, and because of that, they actually had some tie-in between the two. Uh... I forget if you needed to do this by default or if you just had to beat the game in originally, but you could unlock the fusion suit for a secondary playthrough here in Prime. It's just a visual change, but it looks nice. The suit looks a little bulky, all things considered, but it was cool. Plus, you got to see the horrific various suit fusion design in 3D, and there's something funny about that. Weirdly, though, they didn't bring that forward into Remastered, and I've kind of expected them to patch it in as soon as the... Game Boy Advance stuff launched on Nintendo Switch Online, but as far as I can tell, nothing's been done about that, and there's something a little sad about that to me, because that was always a fun extra. I was actually kind of hoping that uh, they would at least add some sort of DLC to Dread after Prime Remastered or the Nintendo Switch Online stuff released, where they would just be like, all right, here's some extra suits for you to play as. It's entirely cosmetic. Not that I wouldn't use it, because I, I honestly, the, the, the Dread power and gravity suit are probably some of my favorite designs in the franchise. But it would have been cool to have extras to see. Also, as you can see here, in Thardis' room now, there's just a fully grown She-Goth. In fact, most rooms where you saw baby She-Goths throughout the game already are now just adult She-Goths. Uh, but the main room of the entrance for Fendrana now has babies, in case you missed them for some reason. And that can actually be a little annoying, because uh, an attack, you didn't really get to see it used much during the mini-boss against it. But adult She-Goths can shake the ground with their stomps, and that can completely mess with your jumps and controls, like you can shake you off to the side. Uh, I think I actually miss a couple of jumps when going for an item completion run here in Fendrana down the line because of that. So, some items we can grab here in Fendrana now that we have the gravity suit and particularly the uh, spider ball. There's a couple of missiles I'm going to be going out of my way to grab. Though there's one I'm particularly annoying, uh, annoying, uh, avoiding rather, until we get the final beam because I need to do something up at the temple when I get that beam anyway. And there you got to see the beam attraction abilities of the adult she gods. I brought that up when I read the scan log of that thing, that part. But uh, yeah, they can absorb your beams and makes it their breaths more powerful. Missiles and bombs are the way to go against those things. So to talk about something. I haven't been talking about much with what's on screen, because I've been talking a lot about navigation and such throughout the LP so far. Two aspects of this game I really appreciate are on the left side of the screen. Uh, the danger meter and the radar. The radar shows you where enemies are in proximity to you. The danger meter increases the closer you get to hazardous materials like lava, like Phazon and all that. And it's there to warn you in the case you're walking backwards towards a hazard. And when it gets higher up, it does actively make a beeping sound to, like, alert you. For space awareness in a game like this in first person with exploration, I think that's a really good idea. And I'm shocked at how few games use something like that. Like, I can think the Prime Trilogy does that. I think Subnautica does something like that. No Man's Sky might. I... I... I haven't really played that. Uh, I am admittedly I was someone who was very skeptical skeptical about that game even before the launch status, but I'm glad to see for fans of it that it looks like it's recovered. So I think that's all the items we can grab here in Fendrana for now. So now it's time for us to head back through Magmore on our way back to the Chozo Ruins. This is a very roundabout route, but it's gonna help us grab a lot of stuff that's pretty good in the long run. For the most part. Uh, there's like one thing I'm not a big fan of, but uh, I'll talk more about that in a few moments. I'm trying to think, though. Going through my memories, playing a lot of Metroid as a kid, and figuring out what was probably the case of 
Remember where you've seen this thing that your new power-up allows you to go and go there. And where I got stuck with that the most, which gets a little tricky because obviously as a kid, as I brought up on the channel before, I, I my first Metroid was Fusion and I played Zero Mission and then Prime and all those. So I kind of grew up during the phase where Metroid always had some sort of a minor hint system that gives you the general location you need to go even if they don't tell you how to get there. In fact, I arguably grew up during uh, the weirdest era because we got very linear games. We also got a game that had so many little hidden extra pads in Zero Mission that it's arguably the most non-linear game in the series. And I, I, I honestly, it probably does come down to something here in Prime 1 overall. Uh, it might have been actually the Furnace Spider Track or going for the Gravity Suit now that I think about it. Because in general, I am pretty good about remembering what I've seen throughout a game, even if it takes me a second to go, where can I... Oh, right, by looking at the map. Which is a reason, again, that I'm not actually the biggest fan of Hollow Knight from what I've played a bit thus far. <laughs> that game's got a lot of cool things in it, but the way its map system works actively makes me not mad, but it irritates me. I'll probably do an LP of that at some point, or at least a stream playthrough of it, just to be like, okay, it's time for me to finally finish this shit. Not that that game is shit, but you know what I mean. So, while we're here in Magmore Caverns, we actually have something new we can pick up. And you're not supposed to know you can do this for a while, but in this particular room in Magmore, if you look over there, that pillar looks a little suspect, so let's blow it up with a super missile. And there is an artifact. You're not supposed to know that's there and destructible, until you get the final visor, I believe. You can't scan that pillar to find out it's destructible or made of cordite. I just know it's there, so I'm grabbing it now. So now we have about a third of the artifacts before we actually have to go searching for them. That is why I think, by and large, the artifacts are the second best version of the endgame key hunt the Prime games have. You can get a lot of them along the way. Uh, Prime 3 is overall the best one because you don't need them all to begin with. Uh, Prime 2's sucks. Honestly, I'd say there's a power gap between Prime 2 and Prime 1's. Uh, it's like, it goes Prime 3, Prime 1, three empty spaces, Prime 2's key hunt. That is bad. But I'll save a lot of my comments on that for when I inevitably get to Prime 2. Uh, like I talked about earlier on in the LP, I've been actually meaning to do Prime 1 and 2 for a while. Uh, but I had been meaning to jailbreak my Wii U and emulate them off of that so I wouldn't have to deal with any Dolphin's weird texture filtering stuff that causes Prime 1 and 2 apparently to have some aspect ratio issues. Uh, but then this got shadow dropped, so I decided, well, I guess there's a better version of Prime 1 to do now. Sure, that means I can't take advantage of some of the glitches, like I actually was considering doing the scan dash tech to get the base jump boots as early as possible, but... Uh, considering it was as far as I was going with that, because I wasn't sure if I was going to. I know at some point I saw an LP of uh, Prime 2 in particular that went through the entire first area, but ignored the boss fight and did some collision jumping uh, to access the second major area of that game before beating the first major boss, which meant they were without the dark suit for, like, the entire game. And it was an interesting challenge run, but not one I would recommend doing, because by the looks, that was hell because that describes Prime 2 in a nutshell. So, there's items we're looking for here in the Chozo Ruins, but most of them are in one room. And admittedly, uh, I actually forgot to get one of them until later. In fact, the very last item I get is one I can get right now with the Gravity Suit, and it's over by where we got the Charge Beam. It's the This is the time you could get all three of those items in a row if you wanted to by saving it. But where I want to go is where we got the Morph Ball. Because if you were paying attention to that room's layout earlier, there's not only a half pipe in it, there's a spider ball track, there's a wave beam door, and there's a bombable object we haven't gotten rid of, so there's a lot we can do in here. Unfortunately, because I saved this until now, uh, Chozo Ghosts. I'm convinced this room being one you might have to revisit several times is the only reason these Chozo Ghosts are here. Although, I'm only now realizing because I'm actually, like, you know, watching the footage instead of, like, playing the game. Honestly, the Chozo Ghosts got a really good visual upgrade and uh, remastered. Like, you make out a lot of their details. Honestly, now I think about it, barring some of the cutscenes in, like, Zero Mission or Fusion, uh, this is probably... Uh, Prime was probably the first time we got a really good close look at Chozo biology because of the ghosts, huh? 
Because the Chozo statues definitely aren't a one-to-one -one of what the creatures actually look like, especially with even old designs from, like, what Old Bird looked like and stuff. Missile tank right there. So now it's time for us to go use that half pipe. And I think this is the only half pipe in the game. No, it's one of two half pipes in the game, actually, now that I think about it. Where there's something on both sides of it. Most of the half pipes, only one side has something you actually need. Uh, but on this one, we want to climb over here to get ourselves another missile expansion. And I should note, I, if you're not at 60 missiles, go get up to 60 missiles somehow, be it picking up enemy drops or getting expansions in the case you're somehow below 60 at this point. Because in order to get all of the items in this area, you need 60 missiles for the main use of super missiles. Otherwise, you're gonna have to backtrack here, and that's just gonna suck, honestly. Now, I can't remember which of the two items in this direction I do first, so it's gonna be a surprise to me as well. Because this room is tall. We're going for this one first. Okay, so if you go in the water here when you have a gravity suit in the wave beam and jump up here, open this door. Artifact number five. I believe this is the Tower of Light one that they referred to in the hints. That sounds right. Also, I should note, actually, uh, the, the Artifact of Truth, the first one we got, uh, that one does have a hint that's only visible in the scan log, I believe. Uh, and the, the hint comes down to, if memory serves, the artifact will appear for those who seek it. So it's if you look for it, you'll find it. <laughs> Which, technically true. So the reason you need 60 missiles for super missiles in this room is because we have to use super missiles on these cracked blocks to destroy them. We then need to do that three more times. Since that's four sets of 15, you need 60. Kind of annoying, but oh uh, well. With that said, this room is actually home to a unique enemy. Uh, you might notice all these little circular holes around the area. Once you've cracked the first tier of these platforms, uh, upgraded versions of the puffer enemies from Magmore show up. And this is the only room they're in. They're not missable, but this is the only room they're in. So make sure you grab them while you're here. I recommend trying to take out the cracked blocks from a weird angle, though. Because if you take them out from the side, that completely negates the chance of the oculuses reflecting them, because that's why there's oculi on all these blo blocks. It's just so they can try to make you miss with your super missile, and then have to either have more missiles or come back to try this again. A bit annoying, but again, oh well. And at the top of this, we got an item that's useful, but not the most useful item in the game. Uh, but it is worth picking up all the same because it makes you into a Ghostbuster for reasons. Where are you? There you are. This is the Wave Buster. This is the newest super missile type. Every one of the four beams has an equivalent to the super missile that you need to find throughout the game. And they all do something a little different. The Wave Buster is a continuous attack that, at the start when you fire it, takes 10 missiles, and then it drains 5 missiles per second after that. So it's very costly, but it does more damage overall than a super missile if you hold it on an enemy long enough. I, in particular, would recommend it against any of the mechanical enemies, like the security drones throughout the game, just because it drains their health pretty quickly. But for most combat, I'd recommend either normal or super missiles overall, just to save on your missile count for now. I'd say using that becomes more viable once you're over like 150, 160 missiles when you have enough of a surplus at any point in time. But for now, be a bit more conservative with your missile count than you might think, especially if you're only down to like 43 out of 115 like I am. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching. And in part 9, we're going to go investigate the side of the crashed frigate now that we have the gravity suit and see where we can go from there. See you guys then.